Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us for this evening's IDF Clinician Education Program, How to Find a Zebra in Your Practice. I'm Kathy Antela, Vice President of Education at the Immune Deficiency Foundation, and I will get everybody started tonight. On behalf of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, we welcome you and we're honored to have you join us. We are excited to announce that in addition to the United States, we have clinicians from seven other countries joining us this evening. IDF's mission is improving the diagnosis, treatment, and quality of life of people affected by primary immunodeficiency through fostering a community empowered by advocacy, education, and research. IDF seeks to encourage that everyone in the United States affected by a primary immune deficiency has a fully informed understanding of the diagnosis that affects them, all available treatment options, the expected standard of care, and all of their opportunities to connect and support, get support within the community. And thank you to each and every one of you for the role that you play as healthcare providers in supporting IDF's mission and vision. So once again, welcome. And during this evening's presentation, please submit your questions for the presenter via the chat feature to IDF, Colleen Brock. She will be um, joining us as the moderator of the Q&A session. So again, questions go to IDF, Colleen Brock. Now I would like to welcome and introduce our presenter, Dr. Sarah Henriksen. Dr. Henriksen is board certified in allergy and immunology and pediatrics. She is an attending physician with the Division of Allergy and Immunology at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and an instructor of pediatrics at Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. And at this time, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sarah Henriksen as she presents How to Find a Zebra in Your Practice. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to present. So we'll be talking today about finding the zebra in your practice. So this is part one of a two-part series. The first is trying to identify immune deficient patients within your cohort. And the second ed um, episode will be um, with other speakers thinking about what you do next. All right, so we're gonna talk about the basics of the immune system, the key elements of inborn error of immunity assessment in clinic and concerning features in patients. We're gonna go through an, a short overview of primary immune deficiency by key categories, um, including an overview of each, the clinical characteristics and relevant testing, and when to consider referring the patient to a clinical immunologist. So if you think about the immune system and its components, we know that the immune system protects us against dangerous foreign antigens using pattern recognition, which is the innate immune system, and antigen-specific cells and humoral factors, which are parts of the adaptive immune system. The cell-mediated components of the adaptive immune system include B and T cells. Rather than having our naive cells cross our entire body all the time looking out for their pathogen or epitope proteins of interest, we have a system of lymphatics that parallels our vessels. And those drain antigens from our peripheral tissues to our secondary lymphoid organs, which include our lymph nodes, spleen, bone marrow, and Peyer's patches. And our T and B cells, our naive T and B cells, go among these secondary lymphoid organs looking for their antigen of interest. And if they find it, they will bind to it and become activated by it and divide and go off into the periphery and fight the infection or malignancy that they need to fight. So again, coming back to the same pattern of innate and adaptive immune system, on the left, the innate system is based on a rapid pattern-based response that does not have memory. So the first time it sees it is the same as the 50th time it sees its pattern of interest, be that gram-negative bacteria, be that a viral response. On the right side, we have the adaptive immune um, cellular response and the humoral response that's slower to develop and it's antigen-specific and develops memory. So if we think about the different kinds of cells that we have as immune system components, we can use their mechanism of action to think about what will happen if they are absent. So for example, with B cells, they secrete antibodies that can opsonize pathogens. They do many other things. We'll use that one for right now. If they're deficient, we most often get bacterial infections. 
We also have T cells, which play roles in directly killing infected cells. And when those are absent, we're more susceptible to viral and fungal infections. Natural killer cells are very important for viral infections as well, as well as malignancy. And this list goes on beyond what's on this slide. Um, we'll continue with neutrophils and macrophages, which are, have an important phagocytic mechanism where they eat up um, what they find around them and present it to other cells. But if we lose that phagocytic capacity, we're more susceptible to bacterial and fungal infections. And then complement, which works by lysing pathogens, um, when absent makes us susceptible to bacteria that it does a good job of lysing. Um, and the board's question there is uh, that you get Neisseria infections. There are other issues if you're lacking complement as well, of course. So this is very broad strokes. So we can think about based on what a cell is best able to do and which, back, which pathogens it's best able to fight, what happens when it's absent and look for those patterns in our patients. We know that monogenic inborn errors of immunity are an increasingly important um, component of, of primary care medicine. There's many reasons for this. One is that we're finding new genes that cause disease all the time. And the immune system is definitely an important part of that growth in our understanding. Um, there are now actually more than 450 monogenic causes of primary immune deficiency. And we do still use the term primary immune deficiency, but another term we can use is inborn errors of, of immunity because it's not just a story of too many infections. We also have now added the, our understanding of immune dysregulation. So here, it, more historically, when we thought about immune deficiency alone, and as we've transitioned towards also using the term inborn errors of immunity, historically, and this is from a lovely review um, that came out last year, we understood that infections um, can be caused by a broad range of pathogens, which is absolutely true. But we now know that we may see susceptibility to a narrow group of it pathogens. We also now include in this group of diseases, hyperinflammatory responses and autoimmunity as other phenotypes of primary immune deficiency. Historically, we thought about pathophysiology doing to, due only to hematopoietic cell autonomous defects, so problems in cells from the bone marrow. But we now realize that our diseases also cause issues directly in our end organs. We thought historically about our diagnoses as being one gene, one disease, that we know the phenotype for a given gene. But we've learned now that one gene can have many phenotypes when it's dysregulated or when there's mutations in it. We've also learned that many genes can cause the same phenotype. So I think it's important to remain humble as our genomic knowledge increases to what we think we know and what we actually understand about the immune system because we have so much to learn. Historically, we've had a lot of supportive treatments and we've increasingly developed new precision therapy and gene therapy, cellular therapy strategies to improve our treatment for our patients. Now, with regards to inborn errors of immunity, when you put them all together, they're not as rare as any of them are individually. There's approximately a million patients in the world, uh, and sorry, in the United States dealing with these disorders, more than 450 genetic syndromes. And these are the categories we're gonna divide them into tonight, adaptive immune response and innate immune response. And within adaptive immune response, combined an immune deficiencies, antibody deficiency syndromes and diseases of immune regulation, and with innate immune response deficiencies, disorders of phagocytosis. So as you think in your clinics about patients and wondering who you should be worried about, as we evaluate for the presence of recurrent infections, think about the medical history. A full past medical history and family history is always important. And if there's a, there are already histories of diagnosed immune deficiency, that will obviously focus your interest. But think about the infection history. What kinds of infections? What kinds of pathogens? What are the severity, frequency, duration, and treatments required? And were multiple treatments required? Do they need hospitalization? Looking for infections where common infections are more frequent than you expect. Think about a common infection at the wrong age. Like are you seeing ear infections in a 30 year old, thrush in a four year old? Even one episode of an infection with an unusual pathogen can be a, a, a um, red flag. And in recent research, we know that severe COVID for example, has been a trigger for genetic evaluation, especially severe COVID in children where we generally expect it to be a fairly mild infection. So taking the extreme end of a, of a common pathogen or an unusual pathogen as being reasons to think about additional investigation. Now throughout this talk, it is always fair to think about asking for advice. It is always reasonable to consider working with a clinical immunologist. But these triggers here with regards to infections are signs that it's worth at least thinking about whether the immune system of your patient is working properly. 
Beyond that, we're looking for any HIV risk factors and making sure they've been tested if it's never been done. Um, a full review of systems with a focus on these areas, the GI system, any autoimmunity in the patient or the family, as we know that immune dysregulation is present in 30% approximately of our primary immune deficiency patients. Hepatosplenomegaly, lymphadenopathy, we know again that immune dysregulation can lead with malignancy or lymphoproliferation. So we don't wanna miss these signs on exam or on review of systems. On the flip side, a lack of tonsils or lymph nodes, the absence of lymph tissue can be a sign. Um, thrombocytopenia, eczema, albinism, hyperflexibility, and unusual fractures are also important to look for. And then your immunization history. So you can know in your testing if you choose to pursue it, whether there's something to test the response to. Someone has not been immunized, that's not gonna be a successful testing strategy. So let's think about what a recurrent infection is. We talk about recurrent infections. So what's the normal pattern for pediatric infections? So if you have children or you've taken care of children, um, you know that about six to eight upper respiratory infections per year are normal in the first few years of life. They last about a week to 10 days, are more common in the winter and are usually self-limited. A really important question for parents is, are they ever entirely well? because patients of all ages should be well between illnesses, especially in children. In an adult who has comorbidities, they may have baseline daily symptoms, but this is a helpful way of looking at whether there's periods of, of wellness. Now in kids, especially toddlers, up to 15 URIs a year can be normal. And there's hypotheses about this being due to an immature immune system and some TH2 skewing at baseline. However, we have a lot to learn about the pediatric immune response. Um, and so these are some general parameters to look at. And folks who are in primary care are well aware of many of these parameters. But when is it too many? When are you starting to think about a primary immune deficiency? Our inborn errors of immunity are actually quite rare. And the earlier we find these children and adults, the better we're able to reduce both their morbidity and mortality. Um, and an IDF survey many years ago found a really significant delay um, between symptom onset to diagnosis for our patients. So it's really important to have that um, eagle eye looking out for these red flags. So what can cause recurrent infections? So if there's defects in host barriers, those can be anatomic, physiological, or inflammatory. For example, toddlers, we know it's normal for them to get ear infections. And there's age-related eustachian tube dysfunction in terms of how toddlers' skulls and drainage are, are built. But we expect them with a normal development to grow out of that, which is why we expect otitis media to tail off. With regards to structures, in the setting of recurrent pneumonia, there's lots of potential causes other than primary immune deficiency that can make you more susceptible as shown here. Chronic illness like asthma can make a viral URI appear more severe without the setting of immune deficiency because of the significant additional symptoms and prolonged nature of the recovery in the setting of that chronic illness. Now beyond those differences, there's also secondary immune deficiencies. In this case, not genetic, but secondary to other medical conditions, exposures, or treatments. These include infections like HIV, cancer, medications, so iatrogenic, that are necessary for the treatment of a given diagnosis, altered nutrition, um, autoimmunity, metabolic disorders, as well as um, more broader genetic differences like trisomy 21, um, and less commonly than both of those inborn errors of immunity. But it's very important to think about the first two before moving on to the third. So again, from a, an older review from um, Gigi Navarangelo, Another, coming back again to this idea of, okay, if we're worried something's wrong, can we use the pattern of infections to help us understand what that might be? So if we look at the type of organism that is overrepresented in a patient's history, that can help us think through what kind of testing to do. Again, if we think about there being um, problems with bacteria, so we take the second row and we go over and we are worried about combined immune deficiency versus phagocytic defects versus complement deficiencies, classically at least, there are, there are some organisms that help us point to one of these as being more likely or something that needs to be ruled out before we move forward. For example, the sentinel organisms that make us think about CGD or chronic granulomas disease, including nocardia. As we move forward and we evaluate for recurrent infections using our physical exam, it's of course always important to complete a physical exam that is thorough. And this includes the overall appearance, including growth parameters, as well as the immune parameters. So the presence of tonsils, exam for lymph nodes, looking for rashes present or recently present, 
Um, and iPhones and other smartphones can be very helpful to ask a family if any there's been recent rashes, which often resolve before a physician appointment. The characteristic of mucous membranes, the presence of hepatosplenomegaly, any evidence of repeated infections in terms of the sequelae, evidence of course of active infection, and then signs for specific primary immune deficiencies, um, which are listed here. And so these are important things that we can gain in the era of telemedicine, some of these are more challenging, but these are the things that we can sort of remember to check off our box and look for if we're worried about primary immune deficiency. Now this is a very busy figure and this is one of the ways that before there was so many uh, monogenic PIDs, this is one of the ways that the IUIS um, divided up our types of primary immune deficiencies. And this was a way of looking at combined T and B cell immune deficiencies. And I actually love this paper. I think it's a lovely way of thinking about sort of a flow chart of thought processes between different branches of immune dysfunction. So this particular um, image is comparing SCID and combined immune deficiency. So severe kind of immune deficiency and combined immune deficiency. But the goal here is not these details. When we think about combined immune deficiency, it's our second largest group of PID. They can have any kind of infection and often have many types of infection. This can include opportunistic infections depending on the cause. Um, and it's characterized by alterations in more than one cell type, but it is a complicated situation. Severe combined immune deficiency or SCID is the most severe form of CID. And here you have very low T cell count and poor T cell function um, to allow a diagnosis. In the era of newborn screening, which I'll bring up in a moment, we know that we're at approximately one in 58,000 live births. Um, and patients present with lymphopenia, severe infections, often chronic diarrhea and failure to thrive. And we split them by the cells that are present and the cells that are absent. And those include T cells, B cells, and natural killer cells. And that helps us divide our patients into groups to think through potential genetic etiologies. Now, how did we get to the point of being able to screen the patients in our country? Um, it is now moving internationally as well. So SCID was fatal until 1968 when the first bone marrow transplant was performed. And before SCID newborn screening using TREX, the absolute lymphocyte count could be used as a screening test. Um, and that works because the majority of your lymphocytes at birth are T cells, but this is obviously not an effective strategy, nor does every child get a CBC. So newborn screening for SCID is based on the idea that when we make baby T cells, and if you go back to med school and think about the process, and I show it here in the upper left, of rearranging and cutting up the chunks of DNA that allow us to create many, 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 many kinds of T cells, while you're going through that process of VDJ recombination, you make little excision circles when you chop out the parts of the locus that you don't need. And we can detect those circles using a qPCR test from our heel stick to find whether there's the signs of normal naive T cell development or not. And thanks to work from the IDF and many foundations and groups, as of um, 2018, all newborns are screened for SCID in the United States and it's increasingly used worldwide. Now, if we think about the kinds of SCID, there are many kinds of defects uh, that can lead to this outcome. Um, and some of the more common ones are changes in cytokine signaling, changes in um, the deamination of ad adenosine, and changes in one of in our VDJ um, enzymes here, the RAG mutations. Now, if we think about diagnostic testing, we're gonna do, once we have a positive newborn screen or a baby who presents ill, we're gonna look at the um, flow cytometry, so counting up the kinds of T, B, and NK cells, well, how well those cells work, and the humoral components of the immune response can be assessed. If we're thinking about a combined immune deficiency, if we're thinking about SCID, we'll be more narrow in our needs because at that early age, the humoral evaluation is not as relevant because you're assessing mom's antibodies. This would all be done with a clinical immunologist by failing the SCID newborn screen, you'll be automatically referred, your patient will be automatically referred to a regional center for further evaluation. But this is the work that we will do. And should we find evidence of SCID in a newborn, we'll move forward, both planning for um, transplant, should that be necessary, and thinking about genetics, should that be helpful. In the setting of combined immune deficiency, which does not meet the criteria for severe combined immune deficiency, the management of the patient very much depends on their clinical state and the parameters of the clinical evaluation. And again, a clinical immunologist would become your partner in that process. Now, if we step to predominantly antibody-based deficiencies, and again, I really like this way of sort of dividing up 
how the antibody side of the immune system can work and not work depending on the quantity and quality of our immune response. Do we have enough of our families, IgA, IgM, IgG? Do we lack one or more of those families? And if you are, do the antibodies that are present, are they functional? Do they respond properly? Do they learn properly? So at a basic level, what is, why do we have antibodies? They do a lot of things, but one of the things they do is they stick directly to pathogens and they can lead to phagocytosis of those bacteria or other pathogens. It's important to know that we have multiple family members. IgA coats our mucosal wet surfaces. So they're responsible for assisting in the defense of the gut and respiratory system. IgE is responsible for anti-helminth immunity as well as playing a very important role in our allergic responses. IgG is demonstrative of a prior response. This is a memory response. Um, IgA, E, and G are demonstrative of a prior response. IgM is a naive initial response. But all of these families work together. There's different parts of the body, different types of pathogens, different roles, but they're all types of immunoglobulins, which is interchangeable with the term antibodies, of course. When those systems are deficient, the infections we most often see are sinopulmonary. And here we're referring to IgG deficiency. Um, and this is about 50 to 70% of symptomatic primary immune deficient patients. So one exemplar here is X-linked A-gamma globulinemia. This is caused by mutations in an important um, gene in the B cell development process. Patients who have this disease known as X-linked A-gamma globulinemia have their B cells stuck in the bone marrow at a, at a specific developmental stage and they can't move forward past it. And so they have no mature B cells essentially in the periphery and are not able to make antibodies. So this is one extreme. And you can see the figure below shows the different stages at which B cell development can be halted and the kinds of diseases we see in that state. Common variable immune deficiency disorders. I like to say that when you've named something with both common and variable in the same name, there's probably a sense that it is a diverse diagnosis that includes many underlying genetic and non-genetic causes. And it is arguably a disease and diagnosis of exclusion. So most of our patients with this disorder have infection, autoimmunity, or lymphoproliferation. And we've had increasingly appreciated the role of the non-infectious components of this disorder. With regard to the humoral dysfunction, there are many definitions of CVID. So this is a broad strokes piece that kind of encompasses all of them. You have a low IgG based on age-based reference values, depending on the, the um, diagnostic scheme that you're using, there may or may not be a lower age, age um, for this disease diagnosis. You have low IgM or IgA or both. You wanna make sure that you're missing changes in T cells in a more combined immune deficiency picture. You wanna make sure you're missing other causes of low IgG. And you wanna look at the quality of your humoral response. Are your antibodies present and are they functional, quality and quantity. This type of diagnosis, this type of initial testing is something that a primary care physician who feels comfortable can pursue. If you see signs of an antibody deficiency, and we'll talk about what that looks like, you could think about starting this analysis on your own. Now, what would this look like? Testing humoral immunity with wondering if there's an antibody deficiency you can look at the B cell numbers. That's more often something done by a clinical immunologist, but looking at the immunoglobulin levels and vaccine responses, the quantity and quality is something that can definitely be screened with a primary care physician. Again, what you'd expect here because of what um, antibodies are best useful for would be an increase in sinopulmonary infections. And what you would do to test that as an initial screen, we commonly look at all um, the IgG, IgA and IgM um, amounts. So this is again quality, quantity, excuse me. And then most often we look at two different tests for quality of our antibody response. One is looking at our tetanus titers, and that is a T cell dependent antigen. And the second is looking at our pneumococcal polysaccharide vaccine titers. And we're looking at a T dependent antigen. Now as adults, many of us did not receive any pneumococcal vaccine. So if you test this, you're looking at the natural infections that that patient has had in children. Um, we are looking at the response if the patient has been vaccinated by their parents. Now, if those responses to the natural or vaccinated um, antigens are low, then what you can do is revaccinate, for example, with a pneumovax if we're over two years of age, 
and check vaccine response in four to six weeks. It's important to note that the vaccine received by infants is Prevnar, now Prevnar 13. That is still a T cell dependent vaccine. It is the booster, the polysaccharide vaccine booster that is T cell independent. So we know that CVID is a heterogeneous diagnosis. And from a wonderful paper from um, Charlotte Cunningham Brundle's lab, this is dividing out who has mortality in CVID over a prolonged period. And in the dotted line, you can see that the people who have low survival are the patients with complications, the non-infectious complications of CVID. And so this is the immune dysregulation component. So what are the concerning features about a CVID patient that make you wanna dig deeper and make sure you're not missing something? Now this plays a more important role for our clinical immunology um, community. But these types of issues, chronic viral disease, mycobacterial disease or opportunistic infections, autoimmune cytopenias, granulomas, severe atopy, diarrhea, this combined with an increase in infections definitely makes you want to reach out to a clinical immunologist. These are concerning signs even within an immunology patient and certainly make you want to make sure that that person's getting a full evaluation. Failure to thrive and diarrhea are two of the biggest signs of T-cell dependent um, immune deficiencies are very important to think about, especially in infants. This is a paper from a few years ago, taking a group of common variable immune deficiency patients and thinking about when do we push further for a genetic diagnosis? A lot of genetic diagnosis is undertaken now. In these patients, it's been, again, looking at patients who have more than recurrent infections um, with, again, some, a, a similar list of concerning symptoms. And in these patients, um, when this is pursued with a clinical immunologist and a geneticist, we find that up to 30% can be found to have a single gene or multiple gene cause of their um, immune deficiency. So very, very briefly, what is, primary, what is immune dysregulation? Immune dysregulation is the scenario where you have both diminished and exaggerated immune responses. It doesn't seem like that should happen. It seems like either your body should underreact or overreact. Either it attacks you and you have autoimmunity or it fails to fight infection or malignancy off properly. But in these disorders, which I've mentioned before, about a third of our known monogenic immune deficiencies, you can see patients who have all three simultaneously. The most commonly involved organ systems include the GI system, autoimmune cytopenias, and skin. Now, why is it important to know what the gene is? Is this just an academic question? No, this is really important. And this is why if you have a patient who you're worried about immune function, especially if you're also worried about the presence of autoimmunity or malignancy, it is so important to refer and have them be fully diagnosed to the point of a mechanism if possible, because there are targeted therapies for some of these disorders that can dramatically improve patient quality of life and lifespan. Now, if we turn to the disorders of the innate immune response, we have congenital defects of phagocytosis, of which there are a number. Be they, again, the same quantity or quality question always comes up. Do you have enough neutrophils? Do they work properly? And so what does it look like um, when they are not working properly? We can see recurrent skin infections or abscesses. Again, sinopulmonary infections. We can get poor wound healing. Um, now that we don't do as much aggressive cleaning of the umbilical cord site, it's less common to actually see this be a sign of primary immune deficiency, but theoretically we can see this, as well as eczema and altered um, oral immunity. And these can be due to cells being absent, cells not moving around properly, or cells not working properly once they get there. So what kinds of tests can we do? Again, this can be done as in the primary care office. If we're worried about immune problems, not only can we think about if we have signs of antibody deficiency, screening the amount of antibodies and their function with our IgG, IgA, IgM, and vaccine responses. But we can also get a CBC, and a CBC does a few things for us. Like we talked about with a severe combined immune deficiency, it gives you an absolute lymphocytic count. Here, when we're thinking about these types of infections and worried about innate immune function, we have the ANC, the absolute neutrophil count, and we can look for severe congenital neutropenia, so never had neutrophils, never has neutrophils. There's also cyclic patterns of infection that can, that can signal a cyclic neutropenia. So cells are there and then they're not there. Additionally, we can think about um, IgE as well as chronic granulomatous disease for which we have a DHR test that shows us whether or not our um, phagocytosis is properly functional in our cells of interest. 
So with concerning system symptoms and test results, there may be a role for genetic testing. What I've shown you before in the testing strategies that I recommended that we would consider either as an initial screen with a primary care doctor, or always when someone feels uncomfortable looking for a clinical immunologist to partner with, there's also the potential that, that genetic testing may be important. Um, as a, and in that case, some clinical immunologists will take care of that themselves. Some will again, partner with another team member, a geneticist. So in the setting where we have a clinical phenotype that makes us want to dig deeper into genetics, um, this is back from 2013, you can start with a gene list or a gene panel um, or progress immediately or subsequently to more broad testing like an exome sequence. Then we go through that data that professional does and looks for changes in genes consistent with the patient's phenotype, making sure that what is diff if we find a gene of the immune system or gene that's been shown in research that may be connected to the immune system has a change from what we consider a normal genome, making sure that that mutation, that change is not common. And then ideally being able to prove that that gene change can change how that protein works in a person or an animal. And so this leads to a pipeline for clinical genetic testing, where if we suspect an inborn error of immunity, if we're thinking about SCID, we have high urgency, so either severe illness or a newborn, we can use a targeted gene panel or even single gene testing because there can be faster. And if we have a need to get to immediate action because of, because of the acuity, that's one strategy. If instead we are able, to, we wanna think more broadly first, um, we may start with a whole exome sequence or WES, and we'll hear more about that, whether you do or don't have findings on the WES in our next session. Finally, a resource for anyone interested in immune deficiency, immunodeficiencysearch.com. This is not actually a commercial site. Um, it's through the Clinical Immunology Society. It's a wonderful resource for learning more about the patterns of immune deficiency, as well as testing for immune deficiency. Both the IDF and CIS have remarkable resources for finding clinical immunologists. If you're looking for someone to partner with to evaluate a patient or have a question, we know that our patients with symptomatic immune errors of, of inborn errors of immunity often go undetected for years before they're diagnosed, accruing end or gauge damage and potentially mortality. So as you're looking in your patients, look for unusually frequent common infections, look for infections that are common in infancy, but now outside that time range. Severe infections, even a single time, for example, COVID-19 requiring the ICU is a topic of a lot of genetic research right now. And there's been a lot of understanding gained about COVID-19 by studying those patients from a primary immune deficiency perspective. Also diseases like herpes simplex encephalitis, depending if they are recurrent, can also have a great deal of insight in that, play, in that um, model. Unusual organisms, even once, like serratia, can, de can definitely um, deserve additional investigation. And then the combination of autoimmunity infections and or malignancy and thinking about immune dysregulation as part of our family of primary immune deficiencies um, all of these scenarios are worthy of deeper thought from an immune perspective and in consideration of, of partnering with a clinical immunologist. Again, you can refer if you're worried whether or not you feel comfortable or have access to the appropriate initial testing. Genetics in our specialty is often an important diagnostic tool, um, but those folks who use it and feel comfortable using it need to be able to feel comfortable counseling to all of the outcomes. And that's why it's important to work with a clinical geneticist with any questions. Um, so I just wanted to thank my lab and my collaborators who have helped me on studies around these issues. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Um, if you have cases or general questions, happy to discuss. Um, yeah, and thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Henriksen. That was wonderful. Thank you so much. So at this time, I would like to introduce my colleague, Colleen Brock, Program Manager of Education. And she is going to moderate the Q&A section, session. So Colleen, take it away. Thank you everybody for being here. Uh, we have a couple really interesting questions. The first one is a case, I have an eight-year-old patient that has normal low IgG and low IgA a history of sinopulmonary infections from two months of age, CD19 double reference range on flow, B cell flow showed very high immature B cells not switched. 
history of low ferritin, patient being worked up for celiac disease, how much is related to suspected celiac versus something else? And would this be a patient to send for genetic evaluation? Wonderful. And so just so I hear, we have an eight-year-old patient who's had recurrent sinopulmonary infections since young age, low IgG and IgA in the setting of a celiac evaluation. Um, other yeah, very high immature B cells, which did not switch. Okay. Okay. Um, and the and low of, ferritin. And low ferritin. And the kinds of infections were sinopulmonary? Yes. They okay. said low IgA, IgG is normal, but I guess it's like low normal. Okay. Got but it. it's technically normal. Okay. So a couple of things to think through, and part of it depends on kind of what your own clinical expertise is. So if you are, if you're in primary care and you've already gotten all of this evaluation, that would be very impressive because it's very unusual to get flow cytometry as a, um, as a primary care doctor. If you were a primary care doctor, I would say this is a great moment to, you know, to call a colleague and engage with um, additional evaluation. Questions that I would wonder about in the setting of low normal IgG and if IgA is absent along with recurrent infections um, would be thinking about the quality of the vaccine responses, which again, on the primary care side is something that can be obtained. Um, but again, a very reasonable time to think about uh, moving forward with additional evaluation. I'm guessing from, from what you've already looked at that, that you're an immunologist. Um, and I think at this point, it kind of depends on the severity of the infections, you know, have they needed IV antibiotics, how, how recurrent is the recurrence of them? Is this a lot of pneumonias or you know, ear infections that are continuing in an eight-year-old or is a lot of that historical and they're doing quite well now, but they have these abnormal labs that, they've, that they have in the setting of more reasonable health. Um, with, the, with the elevated immature B cells, um, I'm curious if there's an impact on, on switch memory B cells, which I take from what Colleen is saying is likely to be the case for this patient. Um, and I guess it would depend how low the IgG is. Um, but it is a patient, especially if there was any family history of, of autoimmunity and malignancy. And I know I'm saying a lot of things you probably are aware of, um, but just to sort of for the whole group, if we're seeing signs in the family, that would increase my likelihood of pursuing genetic evaluation. Um, and there are definitely options that are panels right now that are quite fast and quite inexpensive for the family. Um, depending on the severity of the overall picture, um, and the vaccine responses, especially if there was a functional defect, I would definitely consider moving forward with genetic evaluation. If not, and depending on the health of the patient, you could consider a watch and wait strategy and continue to monitor the patient to see if there's a stabilization or diminution in numbers and function, and then decide whether to pursue genetics at that point. Um, unfortunately, it's also important to consider not unfortunately, but there's the complexity of insurance as well and whether their insurance will support genetic evaluation. Um, it's important to say that there are options for um, patients who do have genetic, have problems with their insurance being able to get genetic testing. Um, but some for some of the panels, it can be much more straightforward than for example, an exome, if you've progressed it to wanting to pursue a genetic evaluation. Um, the thing to realize with panel testing is that you will get back all variants that are considered not normal that have been validated for any phenotype because no phenotype information is given for panels. So you'll often get back a lot of information for you know multiple variants for a given patient it would not be unusual. And then you'll need to be able to deal with communicating that information to the patient and coming up with a plan to evaluate the importance of those variants for the patient's clinical picture. Um, she said the child has positive reaction to pneumo, they do not need IV antibiotics, recurrence has subsided, and they are working with an, an immunologist. Um, she said, thank you. Um, we will keep it on the back burner for now, and thanks for your input. Absolutely. So next question, can you begin the workup on a COVID patient while they are acutely ill? Do you need to wait for recovery to consider Ig testing? And I would also add to that question, if you need to wait, how long and what kind of testing would you recommend for this patient? Yeah, it's a great question. I mean, um, I'm a member of the um, COVID human genetic effort led by um, John Lamar Casanova and Helen Sue at um, the Rockefeller and NIH. And their strategy for recruiting patients has been 
patients who have severe COVID who are younger than one would expect. So uh, along the range of sort of 50 and below um, who had, had ICU level um, COVID and any children who have had ICU level COVID or even admission for COVID. So it does depend on the age of the patient you're thinking about and the severity of their infection. There are some tests that are most usefully done when someone is acutely ill because they help in thinking about what is the appropriate treatment. For example, in some institutions, the use of a cytokine panel is very helpful to think about what biologic therapies may be adjunctively considered, although they are not primary in uh, treatment regimens. The other piece to consider is that if we're thinking about a genetic evaluation, that can be done at any time because the acuity of the patient will not change those results. And again, if you are worried that it may uh, directly change your inpatient management of a patient, sending those tests while admitted is a consideration one can have. So for example, for a very severe child in the PICU who's COVID-19 positive, one can consider the use of a rapid exome if, if there's significant concern for an undergenic monogenic dis underlying gen monogenic disorder, which may change your treatment regimen. So does it change what you will do for the patient? Um, if it is not accessible um, at the time, then as an outpatient, one can think about whether referring someone to an immunologist for a geneticist for additional testing um, may be valuable once they've recovered. With regards to cellular testing and antibody testing, in terms of the serology to COVID specifically, um, the only time that that's used, and again, it's by some centers, is uh, a serology for COVID may be tested for SARS-CoV-2 for the virus, may be tested when MIS-C is being considered and COVID testing is negative or PCR is negative to try to establish whether there's a link to that virus or not. Um, but there's variability in practice around that issue. With regard to testing things like vaccine responses, because you're worried there might be a humoral, uh, there may be a humoral immune deficiency, that would be A, less likely, but B, you would wanna wait till someone was well to do that kind of evaluation. And cellular evaluation, although again, there may be differences in practice between individuals, cellular evaluation may be very much affected um, by the acute illness. So the question would be what question you're asking of your flow cytometry, whether it would be helpful or not helpful in the setting of um, acute infection. Are you looking for absence of cells, which would not be different? Or are you looking for more subtle differences, which may be masked um, or amplified by an acute infection? So it really kind of depends what you're looking for, what time points are gonna be most useful, but the genetic evaluation is not affected by that piece. All right, thank you. Um, the next question, how does age affect the diagnostic process? So if you have somebody who's older, what are there more specific things to look for and or procedures that need to be done to raise that flag and send them to somebody? Such a great question. You know, I think part of it is practice. I think with the advent of, of newborn screening, pediatric allergy immunology has really been sensitized to the efficacy and importance and utility of, of genetic testing. And I think our age range across the board, rheumatology, immunology, um, almost any specialty you can name in pediatrics is very aware of the potential power of discovering a monogenic disorder because you may improve your ability to provide targeted therapy. So I think it is part of the culture of pediatric specialties. Um, and I think a lot of, for me, from my perspective, a lot of that traces back to the role of newborn screening um, and, and in our field of immunology to skid testing. I think that's really amplified our use and understanding of the utility of genetic testing. So I think in, in adult medicine, there's, there's been less historically less um, genetic testing in clinical immunology, but I think that's expanding. I think our understanding of what um, the role of hematopoietic cell transplant is expanding in adulthood. I think our um, appreciation for the role of targeted therapies has always been there in adult medicine. And I think the role of genetic testing is expanding as it's become clear and the, the number of targeted therapies has expanded. Um, in terms of what tests would you think about, one of the unfortunate realities of our field is that you accrue end organ damage with infection, autoimmunity, and malignancy. And so there may be additional imaging studies that need to be done. For example, how often would you get a CAT scan in a CVID patient? How often would you, you know, sort of the more 
a lot of our long-term consequences will obviously come up in our adult patients. And so there's, there may be more screening, more imaging, because our patients are starting to accrue um, those late stage differences, those late stage effects of their disease. And so again, depending on whether you're an immunologist following an immune deficient patient, and you're saying, what do I do differently for this person who I know to have this disease? versus I'm a primary care doctor, what is my threshold to think about immune deficiency um, as opposed to, you know, as a new diagnosis for someone. And there I would say, you know, we know that a lot of our diagnoses, especially common variable immune deficiency, appear in, in, in adulthood. And so even for providers across the board, it is important to be open to the idea that a new immune deficiency can appear in an adult patient or have been missed. Um, the other category of patients that I think it's been underappreciated is um, categories of chronic illness. So our metabolic disorders, our mitochondrial disorders, our patients with um, chromosomal dis um, abnormalities, there can be a perspective that patients with chronic illness get sick and that that's just the way it is or that it's bad luck. And I absolutely hate the idea of bad luck in medicine if we're wondering about patients who are getting infections or autoimmunity or malignancy more often than they should, from my perspective, they deserve a hunt for the underlying etiology. And it's important to always remember the structural differences that may be present and the secondary immune deficiencies that may answer the question. Um, but we can't forget in our adult or pediatric patients about the potential role of primary immune deficiency regardless of age. Um, and especially with panel testing, genetics may be the fastest and cheapest path to assess a patient who you are, you have concern for in that range. Thank you. Uh, last question, unless anybody else has something they would like to send in. Do you know the average age range of people that are diagnosed with CVID or antibody disorders? It's a good question. Um, I don't have the exact figures and it would very much depend on which diagnosis. So like we, we would expect in the pediatric realm as, as a pediatric allergy immunology doctor that mom's antibodies stop protecting you around four to six months of age. Um, and so we see a wave for our BTK, our agammaglobulinemic patients, those that lack B cells, lack antibodies should present about that, start presenting about that time range with sinopulmonary infections. If we're thinking about more of a common variable immune deficiency, um, Part of it depends on how you define the diagnosis, um, but we see it in sort of the teenage to adulthood range at more commonly, um, but it can really appear at almost any age. So it's not something you can really take off the radar. Um, and we we have quite a number of, of pediatric patients. So I don't have an exact number to quote you, um, but it's definitely something that neither a pediatrician nor an adult doctor can be unaware of without you know, compromising the care of their patients. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Henriksen, for volunteering your time to share such important information with us. It has been an honor to have you here this evening. Thanks to everybody who submitted their cases and their questions. And um, I think we will wrap it up. So once again, thank you to everybody for being here. We hope that you found the information presented this evening to be helpful in finding the zebras in your practice. Should you ever run across a situation where you are unsure of where to go next, we do have a program called Consulting Immunology where you can go to the IDF website and you can plunk in your information and it will go to one of our consulting immunologies, sorry, consulting immunologists and they can help you decide on the next best moves for your patient. It is a free program and you and the physician will converse one-on-one -on -one with each other. So keep that sort of in your back pocket of things that you can do to uh, benefit both yourself and your patient. And we hope you will join us next week, next Tuesday night at seven o'clock, where we're going to have the second part to this series, Found the Zebra, now what? And that is going to be presented by Dr. Karen Chen and Dr. Dr. John Rudis. And they will take this a little bit further into detail 
And they will also explain the treatments that a lot of these patients need to have in order to live a full and healthy life. So again, thank you for being here. We appreciate your time, Dr. Hendrickson. You did a great presentation and we look forward to seeing everybody next week and have a lovely evening. Good night. Thanks, everyone.